Good morning. I'm Dr. Anand Parekh, Chief Medical Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and I want to welcome all of you to our event today for the re release of a new report from the Commonwealth Fund Commission on a National Public Health System. Consistent with our mission at BPC to take the best ideas from all sides to promote health, security, and opportunity, we're honored to host today's release of important recommendations to strengthen the nation's public health system. Over the last two years, and in in the midst of this devastating pandemic, BPC has championed the importance of elevating public health as part of our nation's vital infrastructure. A year ago, BPC's Future of Healthcare Initiative released its report positioning the public health system for the next pandemic, focusing on intergovernmental coordination, a robust public health data infrastructure, and long-term sustainable public health financing. And six months ago, a bipartisan BPC task force, along with a host of national public health organizations, released Public Health Forward, a five-year vision for governmental public health and an actionable framework for state and local elected officials and health officials. Building on this work and complementary in nature, the Commonwealth Fund Commission's report today brings a strong emphasis on the importance of federal health leadership to achieving the vision of a national public health system. Today, you'll hear from the leaders of this commission, along with other health experts about why the time is now to make sure our public health system provides all Americans a consistent and robust set of protections so that we can all attain our highest level of health. Today's program will consist of both remarks and a set of moderated panel discussions. Should you have a question for the speakers, please feel free to enter it into the chat or tweet at, at BPC underscore bipartisan, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to start us off by introducing Dr. David Blumenthal, who will provide some opening remarks. Dr. Blumenthal is president of the Commonwealth Fund, a national philanthropy engaged in independent research on health and social policy issues. Dr. Blumenthal has been a longtime national health policy leader in academia, government, and philanthropy. And we at BPC have greatly valued his partnership on many, many issues. David, welcome, and I'll now turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Anand. It's great to be here, and thanks for your remarks. Uh, the national response to the COVID-19 pandemic exposed profound weaknesses and disorganization in the United States public health system, including failures in testing, coordination, monitoring, communications, and outreach. It exposed gaps in human resources and infrastructure, and it amplified profound underlying inequities in health status and drivers of health. These failures resulted in no small part from lack of a truly national public health system that functions day to day with coordinated leadership at the federal level and with consistent state and local capacity. 
In response, we at the Commonwealth Fund did what we so often do when confronted with an important national challenge. We brought together some of the most prominent leaders in the field to review the evidence and offer recommendations for improvement. The nonpartisan commission is made up of supremely qualified experts who have held roles in both Republican and Democratic administrations at all levels of federal, state, and local government and public health agencies. Chaired expertly by Dr. Peggy Hamburg and staffed by a terrific team of public health leaders, including Jeff Levy, Nikki Lurie, Ann Reed, and Josh Sharfstein. Josh joins us today on this panel. The committee was truly expertly led by this uh, terrific team. At the core of the commission's deliberations was a conversation about what would be necessary for the United States to ensure the health of all Americans, not just during a pandemic, but every day, regardless of where they live. As you'll hear from Peggy and the other speakers, there are clear roles for all levels of government, for the healthcare delivery system, and for community partners as well. It will take sustained commitment to reform the public health system. Utilizing all of our existing authorities and resources and identifying where additional authorities and resources may be needed. The Commonwealth Fund is proud of the Commission's work, which reflects its members' thorough examination and deep understanding of the many public health challenges and opportunities in the United States. My hope is that this report will spark honest, fruitful debate and set us on a clear path to reforms that are sorely needed and long overdue. Our thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for recognizing this unique moment for public health and for its own very important work on the critical need for public health improvement and for partnering with us and others on the release of these new recommendations. With that, I'd like to turn this back to uh, Anand and thank all of you again for joining us today. Thank you, David, for, the, for those remarks. I'm now honored to introduce our first panel with Drs. Peggy Hamburg and Julie Gerberding. Dr. Hamburg served as chair of the Commonwealth Fund Commission on a National Public Health System. She is a former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Gerberding served as a member of the Commonwealth Funds Commission and is a former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to both of you and thank you for your leadership. So maybe to get us started, uh, if both of you, given your experiences and the challenges facing public health, both prior to and during the pandemic, if you could both give your perspective on why the work of the commission is more important now than ever. And perhaps Peggy, we could start with you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. And, and if I may, I'd like to start with a few more formal welcoming uh, remarks, given that this is um, you know, the launch of the commission. I wanna acknowledge um, David Blumenthal and the Commonwealth Fund for their support of this project. And note that as a board member of the Commonwealth Fund, I have a deep appreciation for the breadth and relevance of the fund's work. And I was also very honored to be able to chair this nonpartisan commission um, and work with such an illustrious group of commissioners um, including three former federal public health leaders, four former uh, state health commissioners, and three former city and county health officials, as well as the dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health. Um, together, we've worked for Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, and we came together to try to find a common path to improve the health of our country. And so uh, we really are delighted to be able to to release our report and its recommendations today. And also want to thank you, Anand, for um, partnering with us um, from the Bipartisan Policy Center to announce our recommendations. Um, so as was noted, 
um, you know, really the COVID-19 uh, crisis shown a very harsh spotlight on many of uh, lo the longstanding gaps in public health and its ability to respond to both day-to-day -day, uh, concerns and to uh, a crisis such as COVID-19. It really reminded us that public health may not lack for effort and commitment, but it does lack for structure, resources, and coordination. And uh, while public health and its leaders have struggled to respond to the various um, threats and challenges, both routine and more catastrophic, um, that we really um, need more than ad hoc kinds of strategies. We really need to build a strong, robust, sustainable system of public health, a system led at the national uh, level that will promote and protect health day in, day out, but also better prepare us to respond uh, to emergencies. Um, as was noted, this was a, a commission that was uh, put together quickly and done very quickly in three short months. We met with dozens of groups and heard from hundreds of individuals. And uh, we read many different uh, reports and analyses, including, of course, the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And we heard time and again that we needed uh, to address readiness in ways that were more than just a plan on the shelf or um, countermeasures in a storage facility. And that effective responses really depended on strong routine public health measures and grounded in a core set of capabilities that protect health and save lives every day. Um, and there was also broad agreement that the United States can no longer rely on a discoordinated collection of over 2,800 different public health agencies without consistent standards and accountability for health improvement. So our key recommendation really was to, to focus on building and sustaining a strong national public health system to protect everyone in this nation, regardless of who they are, or where they live and to advance health and health equity every day. And so getting to your core question, to reach this vision, the commission identified what policymakers can do today under existing authorities and where Congress needs to play a role in providing new resources, new authorities or both. And the commission identified four major areas for recommendations. First, the federal government should take the lead in building a national public health system. And this work requires many things, stronger, more coordinated and well-defined vision and action, addressing critical and urgent concerns like fixing public health data, laboratories and workforce, and importantly, a focal point of leadership and accountability within HHS. Second, Congress should provide stable and reliable funding to states, localities, tribes, and territories for public health. This funding should come with expectations, though, that local agencies are capable of meeting critical needs as reflected in a new and revised uh, accreditation process. And in fact, we put forward a recommendation for new monies uh, the recommended funding, about $8 billion a year in new resources, uh, may seem like a lot, but in fact, it pales in comparison to the costs of our, our current state of affairs. The pandemic, as uh, I think all of you know, costs the uh, economy, in fact, trillions of dollars. Third focus and, and area for recommendations was that the healthcare system should work closely with public health agencies, sharing data and workforce and planning together to address a wide range of challenges. This collaboration uh, uh, can lead to progress against many pressing ongoing health challenges, uh, including chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, uh, addiction and overdose that's claiming more and more lives, uh, routine infections and infectious disease management and so much more. But this investment in core public health, its programs and its infrastructure will also better prepare us for emergencies to come. 
The fourth area of recommendations was that public health agencies should work to earn the public's trust day in and day out. This is a necessity. These efforts should include greater outreach and engagement in public health planning and decision making. They should also include an investment in public health communications and a recommitment to transparency and integrity in all that is done. So I hope that this uh, report and its recommendations will be of value. I hope everyone on this webinar and well beyond will read the full report and join us in calling for change. I think that we all recognize that many lives are at stake and we can and must do better. So thank you, Anand. Peggy, thanks for those introductory remarks. You can now find the report on the Commonwealth Fund site. Julie, maybe turning to you for your introductory remarks and your perspective on why the work of the commission is so important. Well, thank you. And I, I certainly join with Peggy in acknowledging the tremendous leadership of the Commonwealth Fund in pulling this commission together, uh, my co-commissioners and all of the people who came together to provide insights and input into the deliberations. It's been an amazing effort in a relatively short period of time. Having said that, I think we all stand strong on the core components of the report, which Peggy has outlined for you. You know, I, I served as a CDC director for seven years, and of course, I uh, learned how important CDC is to protecting health and how important the CDC sciences are in providing the evidence base to drive a lot of health decisions. But I also learned that CDC is not the only federal agency that has a strong impact on public health and how uh, we go about protecting the health of our citizens. Uh, one of the biggest frustrations for me, in fact, was the coordination of all of these efforts across multiple agencies within HHS, but also across cabinets. If you just think about the pandemic we're in, it, it is a whole of government challenge to manage a complex health issue. It's not just HHS or CDC. It involves transportation, the education department, the commerce department, the treasury, and on and on. So we have to find mechanisms that allow us to do a much better job of coordination. I think what we've witnessed in the past two years is an exemplar for disorganization, lack of coordination, under-resourcing, and really a disconnect between the public health system and the healthcare delivery system. Those are exactly the changes that we're trying to address. So in this first major pillar of our report, we really hone in on the federal role. How do we get HHS to better coordinate its responsibilities and priorities in the context of health protection? And then how do we ensure that those efforts are well coordinated with other cabinets uh, within the administration that also have uh, pieces to play, but may not have the health expertise to bring uh, the best possible perspective to the table. So we are proposing uh, the creation of an undersecretary of health position. This person is not to take the place of agency heads, but rather to bring the relevant leaders of the operating divisions together and help coordinate a consistent integrated approach to be able to prioritize the elements of that approach and understand who should be accountable for doing what but also to ensure that the budgets are applied to the priorities in ways that really help agencies and other stakeholders get the job done right. In addition to that role of overall coordination, the Department of Health and Human Services needs to do a better job of providing a voice to those in the state, local, territorial, and tribal communities who need to understand where does the buck stop in terms of really uh, understanding what's being decided, how should it be decided, and what input can they have into the process. So we are proposing the uh, reestablishment or the empowerment of a council that brings the state, local, tribal, and territorial people to the table with the undersecretary to try and accomplish that. Likewise, we need a similar sort of cabinet or White House level process that brings the various departments together. Now, I'm not a 
fan of a lot of councils and bureaucracies unless they have clearly defined objectives and are empowered to actually get something done. But I think if you read the details in this report, you'll see that that's exactly the intent here, not to supplant the roles and responsibilities of the various public health agencies, but rather to augment their effectiveness through coordination, right-sized budgeting, integration with the healthcare delivery system, and above all, being sure that we have accountability and transparency about the results that we're able to achieve. So I look forward to uh, the ongoing discussion on this panel. And, and of course, I'm hoping there will be ongoing dialogue as this report rolls out and people have a chance to reflect and provide input and opportunities to support its uh, ultimate implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, uh, particularly for summarizing uh, the, the first recommendation area on the importance of executive branch leadership in the federal government. One follow up, Julie, to you. It, it does seem that many of the specific recommendations in that first area could be implemented in the short term without new authorities or resources from Congress. Is that, uh, is that fair to say? There are certainly things that can be done now. We already have an authorized assistant secretary for health who could be charged with the responsibility for bringing together the agency heads, setting an agenda, working collaboratively on the priorities and fulfilling many of the expectations we would like to charge uh, the, the future undersecretary role with. Uh, creating an undersecretary position brings the HHS effort in line with the way other cabinets operate, and it's a more empowered level of engagement than probably the current version of the ASH may have. Um, there are authorities that do need to be advanced down the road, and we can talk about some of those specifically, but we don't need to wait until we have congressional engagement or decisions from the White House. There are things that the secretary can do right now. That's great. And it sounds like it, even the HHS Council um, across all levels of public health and the re-energized White House Council also uh, could be done without new authorities and, and be stood up potentially right away. Uh, and Peggy, maybe going back to you, um, Julie mentioned one of the recommendations, again, related to having an important focal point uh, for public health across health and human services. Um, as a former FDA commissioner, Julie is a former CDC director. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how this action would support the roles of the individual agencies? Well, I think this is really very important. We did not intend this to be another layer of bureaucracy, another layer of delay in getting things done. But in fact, a mechanism to really ensure that we're thinking broadly about public health, that we're engaging all of the different agencies within HHS. We're using the, the public health expertise of HHS and this coordinating function to actually engage the other components of the federal government that are in fact both providing services and resources to states and localities that influence public health and can help to improve health outcomes. And then of course, this broader engagement with states and localities, um, tribes and territories, as well as other sectors, um, including the private sector and also community organizations. As an agency director, when I headed FDA, I would not have been happy to have another person at HHS telling me what to do across all of the FDA programs and activities. But I would welcome, um, and I saw on many occasions how it was useful to have HHS, sometimes even higher levels, um, you know, really focus in on an issue and make sure that all the different partners and stakeholders were at the table making decisions and to hold different components of government accountable uh, for actions to ensure that adequate resources were going where they were needed, that there was a comprehensive integrated budget, not just um, one agency always getting um, money um, uh, because they could make their mission sound more compelling or it was more understandable um, to policymakers. And I think, you know, really, we have opportunities that have been underutilized 
to come together and leverage both resources and expertise and commitment in ways that haven't happened if we can really think about public health as a national good and a national program that we're committed to in an ongoing way. That's great, thank you. And Julie, one of the areas of coordination the commission cited in terms of a national public health infrastructure coordination uh, related to data, and, and this is something that you have spoken about, the need for sufficient data authorities um, for, for CDC and federal agencies. Do you wanna speak to, uh, to the data piece as a core piece of the infrastructure the commission focused on? Yeah, I, I think the access to reliable health data, whether it's public health data or healthcare data is absolutely the critical underpinning of any successful health program. And our current data systems are archaic. Uh, we saw this with the challenges that we had in trying to get reliable real-time information about the state of the pandemic. It works well in some jurisdictions, but in other jurisdictions, we're still sending information by fax back and forth. And we really haven't solved the challenge of how do we integrate the health data that CMS and Medicare have with and Medicaid with the, um, with the public health data that is part of the traditional surveillance and disease monitoring system. So um, it, it is ironic and most people don't really realize that CDC has no authority to require data reporting from anyone. Um, we rely on a voluntary system from re some really smart people, including the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists who work on creating the definitions of what should be reported and working out um, how and often and how reporting should occur. But that's a voluntary system and it doesn't work well in an emergency, or at least it takes a lot of time to get it up and running. We could also talk about vital statistics something that would seem as obvious as how many people have died from the pandemic, for example. It takes a long time for that information to arrive at the CDC after it is known that someone has died, a death certificate is completed, verified by the physician and the coroner locally, then that data gets sent to the state. It's processed there. Eventually it makes its way to the CDC, but often there are inaccuracies. So many of the death reports have to be manually checked and re-entered. That process takes a long time. And yet with modern artificial intelligence, machine learning and electronic data competencies, we ought to be able to have near real-time reporting of something as straightforward as births and deaths in our country. So those are just some very specific examples, but I, I, I do believe that the efforts to modernize our data system have already been supported by Congress and there's been progress made, but we have miles to go before we have really fully created an integrated network of information services that provide our ability to detect, to monitor, and to influence health decisions in a constructive way. And I'll, I'll just come back to a point that I've heard Peggy make over and over again. Your ability to benefit from that information should not depend on the zip code in which you live or the community, tribe, territory, or state in which you reside. We need to make sure that these kinds of evidence-based information resources are available for everyone. Thank you, Julie, for that. And. Um... As a final question, Peggy, building on that, these investments in information technology, Julie was alluding to, as well as the, inve invest the, the investments needed in our public health infrastructure, I think the report notes that the commission's recommendations, uh, you know, it, it'll cost some money, about $9 billion annually, but you alluded to this earlier, just place this investment into context of what we already spend on healthcare today and the economic costs of an in inadequate public health response to, to a pandemic. Yeah, well, we certainly learned with COVID-19 that failure to invest in public health um, led to uh, you know, preventable um, challenges, complexities, both loss of life and health, but also damage to our economy, our society, our safety and our security. Um, and that the cost of of the pandemic was measured in the trillions. So the 8 billion or so that, that we are recommending 
for additional investment in public health each year seems like very little. If you look at just what we spend on healthcare in this country, I think we're up to 16.8% of GDP. That is not a small number, um, but so much of what matters for health happens outside of our healthcare delivery system. What we're talking about is taking a much more integrated view where we recognize that there are many drivers of health um, that uh, need to be supported in much more robust and sustainable ways, starting with really uh, building out, strengthening, extending, um, and modernizing our public health infrastructure and creating a public health system that also enables all critical partners um, from the healthcare delivery system to um, uh, community organizations, to other sectors, uh, to all participate and clearly understand the mission, the activities, and uh, the commitment to making sure that we promote and protect the health of all Americans. Terrific. Well, thanks so much to both of you, Dr. Hamburg, Dr. Gerberding. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us today, Peggy. We will come back to you at, at the very end. Uh, at this time, uh, we wanna turn to our second panel uh, featuring Drs. David Lakey, and Dr. Josh Sharfstein. Dr. Lakey is a member of, of the Commonwealth Fund Commission, a former commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, and former president of ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Dr. Sharfstein helped staff the commission and previously served as the commissioner of health for Baltimore City, secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and principal deputy commissioner at the FDA, David and Josh. Thanks so much for being with us today. And uh, I think now we, we'd like to pivot and cover the other three recommendation areas that Peggy alluded to. And David, if I may start with you um, and on the, the issue of funding to create a, a national public health system that ensures everyone has a minimum level of protection. Uh, there needs to be both adequate and reliable resources and expectations. And I was wondering on the former, if you could discuss the funding gap or public health infrastructure and the commission's recommendations of Congress in this regard. Absolutely, and, and first, thanks to Don, uh, and thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for having us here today, and thank you for the Commonwealth Fund for really pulling this together. Uh, I think people need to understand that public health agencies are really stressed, and they were stressed before the, the, the pandemic. Uh, I had the privilege of being the Commissioner of Health for Texas for, for eight years, and, and, and saw how funding occurs. It, it, we have an event, funding is released, we have to staff up, and then the funding goes away, and then we're back to where we are. And as been noted earlier, uh, we have major gaps in the basic infrastructure you need to ensure that all residents of the United States have the basic public health services that they need in order to be healthy. And I think we need to realize, you know, if we look at life expectancy, maternal morbidity, mortality, infant mortality, you know, a variety of health measures, we're not nearly where we need to be here in the United States. And, and so folks have looked at the, the cost of providing that basic public health infrastructure, and it would be about $32 per person per year. And if you take out the money that's already there, about $19 per person per year, uh, that, that that has a gap of about $13 uh, per person per year, which comes out to the $4.5 billion. So it's really a bargain. You know, the, the amount of money that we can put into public health and prevent disease so people don't end up into the hospitals it is really uh, beneficial, cost beneficial. It saves lives and it saves dollars. Uh, there's a huge return on the, this type of investment. And I think it's, it's more than just the, the, the gap of the, the dollars, it is the gap of the, the critical capabilities that our state, local, tribal, and federal agencies do not have because those funds aren't there. The, the basic ability to gather public health data, to be able to look at the differences in different groups of individuals so we can identify disparities, identify the inequalities of health uh, that, that occur throughout our, our United States. It is the, the inability to really coordinate, the gap in coordinating across state agencies, uh, federal agencies, the whole systems, and with our communities to really to be smart in our approach to improving health. 
and, and the ability to really have those foundational capabilities that all health departments need in order to be able to uh, do their job. And, and it, you know, we, we've looked at, you know, the epidemiologists, uh, the capabilities that workforce across the United States, you know, a lot of our health departments can't even afford a, a basic epidemiologist. And it's hard to do public health if you don't have an epidemiologist that knows data and knows how to gather that data. So you can have evidence-based data-driven decisions to develop our policies, develop our programs, and improve the health of our nation. That's great. Thank you, David. And, and Josh, I guess with the resources, I think the commission wanted to ensure that their set of expectations, accountability as well in this partnership between government, uh, between public health at all levels. Can you discuss some of the expectations the commission recommends for public health departments to have uh, these basic public health capabilities? Sure, and I think that's a really important part of these recommendations. This is not uh, calling for a blank check. It's calling for a specific um, amount of funding for a specific purpose um, with clear standards and expectations for what should be delivered. And, and those relate to what uh, David was talking about, the foundational capabilities in, in public health, the ability of health departments to effectively communicate, to work with their communities, to be able to assess the health of their community. Um, there's, there's a set of those capabilities that has been well described and many health departments cannot do them. They are not funded to do them. They're not staffed to do them. So what emerges is essentially a uh, agreement. The federal government will provide consistent resources to um, uh, health departments and states, localities, tribes, and territories. And in return, they will deliver those capabilities. So the question comes up, well, how do you measure that? How do you know? And so the commission um, uh, talked about the accreditation process, revising the accreditation process, and then requiring that as a condition of getting those core infrastructure funds that health departments be accredited and demonstrate that they can actually um, achieve those foundational capabilities. So it is really about results um, because we know that as those foundational capabilities are achieved, those health departments will be able to deliver on some of those ongoing public health challenges that Dr. Hamburg mentioned, as well as be much better prepared for future crises. Terrific, thank you, Josh. Uh, David, I wanna pivot to the third area of recommendations. There are a number of questions coming in uh, in the chat from the audience related to public health, healthcare integration. Obviously an area that's been discussed for a long time, uh, questions related to hospitals and community health centers, how they interface with, uh, with public health departments, questions related to data and workforce. Can you discuss what we learned from the pandemic about why this public health healthcare connectivity is so important? And, and what, did, what did the commission say in terms of building these connections uh, for health improvement? Thanks, Anand. I, I think this is really important. I, I think for too long, we've been satisfied with sick care, the hospital care system, medical care being very separate from public health. And, and that doesn't, work. That, that is a recipe for failure. Uh, we really need to integrate those two if we want to be successful, not only in emergencies, but to meet the day in and day out needs of, of, our, of our communities, of our populations we serve. Um, I think an example of that has been the pandemic. Uh, there are a lot of things that the state health departments, local health departments needed to do, but they couldn't do on their own. And the individuals in the healthcare community really stepped up to to be on the front lines of this pandemic, uh, whether it was treating individuals in the hospital, whether it was providing vaccines, whether it was stepping up uh, the ability to do testing in their, their community, the clinical trials, all those things that were really, really important to get us through this, this pandemic. Uh, the health departments couldn't have done that by themselves. But we also need to capitalize on that partnership uh, in the times where we don't have a pandemic. Uh, we, we need to be able to work together to address the issues of infant mortality, maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States, uh, the, the diabetes issues that we have, you know, the, the litany of health problems we have in the United States. It, public health can't solve those, those issues by themselves. Healthcare can't solve those by themselves. We really have to work together if we're gonna have and have a unified approach, if we're gonna be smart in how to address these, these issues. 
And so there's there's basic things like having data, being able to share data. Uh, and so the health departments know when there's a challenge going on with a, various infectious diseases or other chronic diseases in their community and, and have that information so they can develop smart programs that, that addresses the root causes of those, those issues. We, we need to have individuals in the healthcare system that understand public health, whether they're at the, you know, in the payer side or in the hospital side and the delivery side, they need to understand the systems that are in place so they can function with those, have the ability to talk to the, those individuals in public health, and again, work together. I, I used to say when I was commissioner, you know, the time to exchange business cards isn't at the scene of the disaster. You need to do it now if you really want to work together. And I, I think that's really, really important. We need to have people that can cross train. And, you know, how do we really train individuals in the healthcare system? How to work in public health? How do we train people in public health? How to really fit in to the healthcare system so that we can, again, be, be that, that partner. And again, do this um, during the pandemics, but, but more importantly, or as importantly, day in and day out to address these major challenge uh, challenges our nation faces. Thanks, David. And Josh, uh, David alluded to this, but the commission noted the important role of public and private payers. Can you talk a little bit more about the important role of CMS in this regard that the commission cited? Sure, absolutely. You know, when there was the, the pandemic hit, it was everyone's expectation that CMS would do whatever it could to help the nation's response. They were changing their infectious disease guidance and their payment rules and their telehealth rules. Like it was, you know, the national emergency that it was. But we have other national emergencies and CMS can uh, be very helpful with um, overdose and uh, maternal mortality and a number of other areas in partnering with public health. Now, what can that look like? Um, it could start with producing uh, maps of de-identified information and sharing them with state and local health departments. When I was the health uh, secretary in Maryland, we were able to do this with data from CMS and other payers and be able to say, like, look, um, here's where preventable asthma admissions are coming from. Maybe, you know, there's something that we can do there to prevent uh, kids from struggling to breathe. Or here's where uh, older adults are falling and breaking their hip, which is a really, you know, horrible thing to happen and, and uh, is associated with uh, early death. You know, we should be able to figure out, is there something in that community that is going on that can then prevent that? And the more you do that, the more you share information and understand the the different issues that are going on, the better prepared you are for a crisis when some of those very issues may come into play. In addition, CMS can support uh, Medicaid collaborations, um, making sure that, for example, managed care plans aren't off in their own bubble, kind of doing different population health activities, that they are working with their state health agencies and the community providers and community organizations um, to improve health. And let's be honest, CMS has some pretty serious uh, leverage over the healthcare system. The vision that David talked about, and he's a, a healthcare leader now, is just so important. And it's important for the federal government to use some of that leverage um, in order to expect that health systems will work to support the health of their communities. It's just not good enough in 2022 for them to just wait for people who are sick to come through their doors. It's important to set the standards, set some basic expectations, and then create a fertile environment for collaboration between healthcare and public health. Great, thank you, Josh. And again, to the audience, if you have questions, please uh, share them in the chat or, or tweet at BPC underscore bipartisan. Uh, David and Josh, I want to move to the final area of recommendations from the Commission, uh, and that relates to trust. Hard to have a conversation about public health without talking about trust. Uh, so, David, how did the Commission recommend we rebuild trust in public health efforts across the country? Well, first, I think we have to realize that we have a problem. Uh, you know, if we go back over a decade, about 43 percent of the American population had a positive image of public health. Following the pandemic, we're down to about 34%. And we really need to build that trust if we're really going to drive these programs forward to, to um, trust in the federal government if they're going to put this type of money in. And again, Josh talked about the role of accreditation. Uh, but we also need to build trust in our communities. And, and there's historic reasons why certain communities don't trust public health. And going back to the Tuskegee trials, a variety of events that have occurred in the past, 
Uh, and then following this event, the, the, the for the pandemic, the, um, the 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 mixed messages that that came out in a variety of reasons that the people lost trust. So we have to realize we have a challenge in trust uh, if we're going to move this this forward. I think part of the the way that we combat this is we really engage our local communities. We need to have a commitment to have effective, meaningful, and representative community engagement uh, as a core component of everything we do, whether it is at the federal advisory level in the committees, uh, building that capability with technical assistance and grant applicants, uh, really using community-based organizations to guide the work that we do. Uh, we, we also need to have multi-sector partners to address the basic needs related to health and to build the infrastructure and standardizations of, of expectations. You know, as I noted earlier, public health can't do these things by themselves. They really need to partner with the healthcare system. But uh, Dr. Gerberty noted earlier, you know, the work with other types of sectors, whether the transportation, you know, a variety of other sectors really coming together to address the, the, the core problems of their community. Uh, we need to modernize our communication strategies. You know, there are uh, smart ways to communicate with individuals. Uh, people can be trained to, to do that in a way that builds trust in the community to make sure that when somebody comes up and talks that they can be relied upon to be providing truth in their conversation. Uh, and, and part of that is to, to work again with the communities. And I think throughout the pandemic, we learned that many times people wanted to hear from their pastor or a community leader versus a talking head. You know, somebody that, that has been on the, the news networks and, and, and does this on a regular basis. They, they want to hear from their pastor, their physicians, the people that they have developed trust in for a long period of time. And we need to work with those individuals to help, help them be able to uh, provide that information. And then, then finally, we should uh, create the conditions uh, within HHS that, um, that we can ensure that... Um, we have a foundation of ethics and integrity related to the public health activities, uh, making sure that that is the topmost priority of HHS, that basis of ethics and integrity, uh, so that when a federal official says, um, and provides advice, when, when they are providing guidance, that people will feel confident that the reasons that they're providing that information uh, is that it's the best evidence possible and it's not driven by other agendas that could um, distort that advice. Thank you. Thank you. And Josh, related to that, uh, if you could discuss some of the com committee's commission's recommendations on how the federal government can play a more vigorous role in the face of misinformation. There's also a, a question in the chat from the audience about you know, how technology could be helpful um, to public health. So if you can tackle, uh, tackle those questions. Sure. You know, the challenges of earning trust are very high, uh, particularly now, and it's especially difficult to do so in the sea of misinformation that we find ourselves in. And uh, the, the commission um, was is very supportive of the work of the U.S. Surgeon General on addressing misinformation, and it really comes down to reducing bad information and improving access to good information through multiple sources, including the community um, trusted sources that David spoke about. Reducing um, the bad information, the completely erroneous, the, you know, all the stuff that we've seen out there, um, some of the most, um, you know, posted messages being uh, falsehoods about vaccination, for example, that's going to require a, a lot. That's going to require a lot of work. It requires, as the Surgeon General has noted, more transparency from social media companies, more responsibility from social media companies, and a lot of work um, by others who are um, engaged in the media environment. Um, in terms of adding better information. You know, um, I, I once met an expert in disinformation, kind of from the law, uh, from the FBI, former FBI agent, and, and he looked at me and he said, you know, the problem with public health these days is that you think the key is to just be absolutely perfect about the message and get it exactly right, and then you just say it once, and you hope people will believe you, but they're getting that one message amidst 10,000 misleading messages. So it's really important to have a communications effort that's robust, 
that is um, uh, speaking to people in different ways, depending on um, how they like to hear messages on different platforms. Um, we, uh, the Commission has, has said very uh, clearly in the recommendations that there's a lot that um, the federal government can do to support really effective communications um, by uh, health departments. And then um, finally, that aspect of partnership, because um, to a certain extent, the answer to misinformation that's online is analog to get out into the real world with people who are really trusted. And, you know, um, I certainly have seen that in my own public health experience that um, people are able to relate um, to people that they know. In Baltimore, we had a very successful campaign um, to reduce infant mortality that was based on community members sharing messages about their own experiences with safe sleep of infants, for example, and, and really helping health departments develop the skills to do that kind of partnership and do those kind of communications. That's a core skill. That's a skill that can be built for multiple different issues today and then be ready uh, to turn on when the misinformation comes in an emergency. Great. Thank you, Josh. I think we have time for one more question. Looks like one has come from the audience uh, for both of you, David and Josh. Uh, the question is, this is so inspiring to see a federal response. How can we as a local health department, data collectors, support the commission's findings? So what can local health departments do to support the commission's findings? Well, I can start off and then Josh, hand off to you. You know, I, I think first, please read the report. Look, look through the report. Um, there's a New England Journal of Medicine article related to, to this work. Look through that information and share it. Share it with your, your local community, the, the partners that you work with. Uh, think through it, uh, again, in that community structure and think through how do we work together to improve the, the nation's public health. Um, I, I think there'll be a series of other conversations, you know, that, that would need to occur, you know, working with your local legislators to say, this is really important with your local mayor to say, you know, we really need to change things in our community. We need to have the data. We need to have the infrastructure. We need to have the systems that, that, that really are essential if we really want to do our jobs in protecting the public's health. Josh? I, I would just say, first of all, thank you for the work you did during the pandemic, local health departments. Mm -hmm. Uh, often bore the tremendous responsibility under incredibly adverse circumstances and were responsible for saving many, many lives, um, even without maybe so much appreciation. Um, local health departments are described in the commission's report as the backbone of public health. And what I would add to David saying is that for the federal government, you should have high expectations. Mm -hmm. I think it is, you know, from your perspective, completely reasonable to think that funding should be forthcoming to support the basic capability that you have, that the agencies at the federal level should be coordinated in supporting you in the work that you're doing um, to address the critical priorities that your community has. And as you work with community organizations and uh, local leaders, like David said, I think it is um, entirely reasonable for you to turn to the federal government and expect it to be a true and coordinated partner. That's what we envision in this report. The Commonwealth Fund Commission is really about building a system that really works for everyone, including uh, the people that, that you know the best. Great. Well, thank you, Josh. Thanks, David. Thanks to both of you for joining today. We're very appreciative. And now we'll transition to closing remarks, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Reed Tuxen. Dr. Tuxen is a former commissioner of public health from the District of Columbia, a longtime healthcare leader as well, and most recently founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Uh, Reed, I'll turn it over to you now for some closing remarks. And, and, in, and in addition, please feel free to address any of the questions, Reed, that we've discussed today. Well, thank you so very much. And um, I will reiterate five quick uh, points uh, in my few minutes uh, that have that, that stood out to me in the report and in, in the comments by my colleagues. The report is clear. Ensuring and maximizing our nation's public health will require engagement and accountable leadership from all levels of society. When it comes to the health of the public, it truly is that we are in this together, but we must be in this together as respected partners. Those federal, state, local territories and tribal governments are obvious, but leaders of large health systems, as well as practitioners in small primary care practices, leaders in communities, churches, social fraternal organizations, barbershops, schools, and more are all part of the equation. I would have also observed that it is essentially important 
that we get better and more focused coordination and leadership across HHH agencies themselves. So CDC, ARC, HRSA, CMS, ONC, all of them have to be on the same page because those of us in the community who are trying to work need a coordinated uh, sense of HHS across the board. Number two, I certainly agree that our revitalization of public health must result in assuring equity, that where a person lives, their race, ethnicity, income should not affect uh, an individual's public health related opportunities to live a maximally healthy life. This means that we have to revisit the funding infrastructure and mechanisms for public health at the community level. We have to overcome the dysfunction caused by focusing on disease specific initiative with resources that wax and wane unpredictably and that are unsustainable. Community and faith-based organizations need funding that is not crisis reactive, but that meets the level of individual community need and that is facilitative of building stable and reliable infrastructures to address multiple ongoing challenges as well as pivoting when needed be to crisis response. Above all, we need to stop taking minority health concerned organizations for granted, simply expecting that they will do the work because their communities have no alternative but to cobble together engagements even without tangible support. Number three, this essential goal of equity and public health outcomes also requires, as the report recommends, that public health leaders earn public trust through enhanced community engagement and shared decision-making as was just discussed. Building trust and maintaining trust takes time. We have a lot of negative history and we have a lot of contemporary insults that must be overcome. We need to start today by partnering with those who are already trusted. And I do agree with my colleagues, minority physicians, faith leaders and social fraternal and other organizations uh, who are increasingly coordinating their efforts for scale and sustainability need to be engaged. What is happening is that because we in the minority community have not enjoyed stable funding and do not have uh, uh, and, and are only sort of cobbling together things at the end of the day, the result has been though that, that physicians, faith leaders, social fraternal organizations have come together to create a firmer foundation upon which to build. So there is a structure here that now can be fully exploited. I would emphasize the essential importance of adding and publicizing the participation of physicians and other health professionals, public health experts and scientists of color on all of the advisory boards and federal health decision-making bodies, not only at the federal level, but the state and local. It is very difficult to sell the message of truth and evidence when we don't can, and it cannot show that there have been people of color inside of the room making the decisions, part of the process, representing the interests of communities that are so often disenfranchised. Number four, the report makes an important observation of the relevance to public health that the care delivery system uh, is undergoing this defining transition from episodic uncoordinated fee-for-service reimbursement that poorly serves the comprehensive needs of people, especially the poor, people of color, and rural Americans, towards this more comprehensive, integrated, coordinated, and person-centric system energized by value-based reimbursement. This opens up new structured engagement opportunities as we have discussed. I think this is gonna be important, but it means that you have to have data. And the data I hope will also include that Julie talked about, it's gonna be social determinants of health data that will be connecting community level workers with the larger preventive and clinical system. And finally, uh, I would draw the attention to the commission's encouragement for supporting community-based efforts that challenge the issues of health literacy, misinformation, and disinformation. The pandemic has certainly dis, uh, given us the importance of that, and we just heard that discussion. I would say, though, that we've got to focus in on how we educate people about modern relevant science principles and concepts. And so I certainly do hope that we will be finding ways of partnering our school system science education with our public health efforts so that people will have the background scientifically to engage with a modern uh, public health uh, and clinical care delivery system. Thank you so much for the chance of commenting on these extraordinarily important issues that are in this extraordinarily important report. Thanks so much, Reed, for those important remarks, those five points that, that, you, meet, that you made, the importance of partnerships, uh, the focus on health equity, eliminating health disparities. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And now I'll bring back uh, the chair of the Commonwealth Commission, Dr. Peggy Hamburg, 
to wrap things up for us today before we conclude. Peggy? Well, thank you so much. And I think this was a great discussion. Um, and you know, thanks to everyone who has participated, both those of you watching, and importantly, all of you who were presenting and discussing. I think it gives some sense of the, the quality, the level of expertise and experience um, that uh, went into this um, commission report, the, the expertise of the input, the support uh, team, and the, the expertise and experience of all of the commissioners. So, so thank you all and thank you Anand for sponsoring this. David Blumenthal began uh, this session talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic really shone a very harsh spotlight on uh, the profound weaknesses and the disorganization in the US public health system and highlighted long-standing issues and concerns, uh, including um, gaps in the infrastructure, inadequate funding, and of course, uh, health inequities. We face many, many and growing health challenges um, as we address day-to-day uh, -day concerns. In fact, life expectancy in this country has been declining in recent years for a number of reasons that include issues with, that we have to deal with on a routine basis in our public health and healthcare system. We need a strong national public health system to help us address these concerns and to better prepare us to respond to future emergencies. David Lakey just noted that um, uh, the commissioners uh, penned an article for the New England Journal of Medicine, which just came out this, this morning. And the article discusses uh, the commission's recommendations for a national public health system. And it ends with a, a, not a statement, but a question, if not now, when? The report includes, importantly, not just a framing of the problem and a critical set of areas that we need to focus in on, but a list of actions that can be taken today to promote health, reduce disease, and save lives from ongoing health challenges, protect our economy during future public health crises, and respect the extraordinary sacrifices of public health and healthcare workers during the pandemic. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning about this commission and its report. I look forward to working with the Bipartisan Policy Center Policy Center and all of you who've been um, uh, listening in on uh, this discussion uh, to advance these recommendations and bring them to reality for the benefit of our communities, our nation, and I think for the world. Thank you.